to the country. The purpose of our hearing today is to examine the fiscal year 2025 budget of the Space Force. Mr. Hill, I understand that you are testifying on Space Force policy issues in lieu of Dr. Plum, who recently uh, left us. I will want to know the actions that your office has taken to help lower the classification levels of space programs so that the warfighter can use them more effectively. Many of these programs are so highly classified that few, if any, can use them, prohibiting information sharing in a time of conflict. Mr. Cavelli, you are responsible for the acquisition of space assets. In October of 2022, you issued a memo on space acquisition tenets that outlined such common sense objectives as don't launch satellites before the ground system to use the data is complete. It's pretty good advice. Thank you. As well as efforts to hold the industry accountable for the systems that they build. I'd like to know if you believe that those tenants are having an impact and that you hope that they would uh, on the that would uh, that you hope that they would back in October of 2022. Uh, General Gaitland, this is year four of the Space Force as a separate Title X service. If you look at the wall, your flag is there along with the other service flags. Now that you're a Title X service, I hope that you can share with us how you are training to defend our assets in space as well as to help the warfighter on the ground achieve their objectives if called upon. For fiscal year 2025, the Space Force is requesting $29.4 billion which is a $600 million decrease from the fiscal year 2024 request of $30 billion. General Gaitland, it will be important to explain to the committee in open session how this essentially flat budget, actually declining budget, is impacting your ability to train and equip our guardians to support the combatant combands. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for joining us. And uh, after our short opening statements, we will have of rounds of five-minute questions of our witnesses. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Senator King. Mr. Hill. Are you correcting us? Yes, he, he was correcting. He was correcting my pronunciation. Good line. Sorry about that. Thank you, Senator. I'm sure I'm not the first person to ever mispronounce your name. No, sir. I've grown up with that name and I've heard it every which way. Thank you, sir. Secretary Cavelli, Mr. Hill, General Gutline, uh, thank you for being here today and for sharing your perspectives with this subcommittee and thank each of you for your service. As this subcommittee knows, our capabilities in space provide our forces with unparalleled communications, targeting, and intelligence. Every other service relies on Space Force capabilities to close the kill chain. Our adversaries know this, and space is no longer a safe haven. It hasn't been for years, and it's taken the department far too long to openly acknowledge this. The fact is we need to be investing more in both offensive and defensive, offensive and defensive space systems to counter our adversaries and safeguard our assets on orbit. And we need a space acquisition system that can do so effectively and quickly. I look forward to, to hearing about progress being made in space acquisition and what more can be done. However, we cannot maintain space dominance unless we provide the Space Force with the re resources needed to do so. I was disappointed by the President's budget request, but I hope to work with my colleagues on this subcommittee and on the Appropriations Committee to provide funding for additional space systems, including one on General Whiting's unfunded priority list. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hill, are you leading off? Thank you, Chairman King and Ranking Member Fisher and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for inviting us to testify on the Department's fiscal year 2025 space budget. We are clearly in a time of rapid change in the space strategic environment, one which does not favor the slow or those resistant to change. China and Russia are rapidly fielding space and counter space capabilities to hold the joint force at risk and to deny us the space-based services on which we rely. The scale and scope of the threats in space present significant risks to the American people, to our national interests, to allies and partners. To meet these challenges, 
and working within the constraints of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, the President's fiscal year 2025 budget requests $33.7 billion for space. Some of the critical investments include $2.4 billion for National Security Space Launch, $1.5 billion for more resilient positioning, navigation, and timing, $4.2 billion for more resilient and protected satellite communications, and the Space Development Agency's proliferated low Earth orbit transport layer, $4.7 billion to develop new missile warning and missile tracking architectures, and $12.3 billion for a range of capabilities to increase the resiliency of our existing architectures and protect our interests in space during competition, crisis, and conflict. In addition to our space inv investments, the Department has made significant progress over the last two years on four key space strategy and policy priorities, which I have detailed at length in my written testimony. These are space control, space cooperation, space classification, and commercial space integration. In short, we have obtained presidential guidance to assure our space missions and to protect and defend the joint force from space-enabled attacks. We have significantly expanded our space cooperation with allies and partners, charting a path towards true combined operations in space that will strengthen our collective deterrence and defense. And we have overhauled the department's space classification policy to remove unnecessary barriers to information flow throughout the joint force and with our partners and with industry. And we have released the first ever Department of Defense commercial space integration strategy to harness the commercial sector's incredible innovation and to enhance our capability, capacity, resilience, and mission assurance. Going forward, the department will continue to press on all four of these lines of effort. I believe the progress we've already made together will pay dividends for years to come. In closing, thank you again to the committee for its partnership and for its tireless dedication to the department and our service members. I look forward to answering your questions. Mr. Cavelli, Secretary Cavelli. Chairman King, Ranking Member Fisher, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. With the growing threats in space, we must continue to transform our space architecture to be more proliferated and more resilient so that it could always be counted on during times of peace, crisis, or conflict. As the Service Acquisition Executive for Space, I am focused on two things, driving speed in our acquisitions and delivering programs on cost and schedule. I'd like to highlight some of the progress we've made since I testified before this committee last year. Since the spring of 2023, the Space Development Agency has delivered 27 satellites to orbit, nearly all of them in around three years from contract award. This includes eight new missile warning, missile tracking satellites, and 19 data transport satellites. With these systems, we've been able to demonstrate the first ever Link 16 network connection from space, a capability that will allow warfighters to send beyond line of sight messages. The Space Rapid Capabilities Office completed and is in the process of fielding the first 11 of 24 low cost transportable terrestrial satellite communications jammers. These jammers went from contract award to fielding in about 18 months. Additionally, last June, Space RCO completed an on-orbit testing of its enhanced threat awareness payloads and delivering those payloads to the Space Force programs to use. Meanwhile, the Space Systems Command continues to make outstanding progress towards modernizing both our missile warning and military satellite communications architectures to be more resilient. Space Systems Command launched the first weather system follow-on microwave satellite last month to support the pivot to a more resilient, disaggregated hybrid weather architecture to meet warfighter requirements. Last September, Space Systems Command's tactically response to space mission known as Victus Knox demonstrated the ability to go from factory floor to on-orbit operations in less than five days. And since April of 2023, there have been seven national security space launches that deliver critical warfighting capabilities to orbit. SSC is also adding resilience through, through allied partnerships. For example, they delivered two enhanced polar system payloads, which will be hosted on Space Norway satellites that will be dual launched this July, providing protected satellite communications in the Arctic region. Space Systems Command even broke ground this summer in Australia, or last summer, on the Deep Space Advanced Radar Capability Site 1, 
and will award design contract for Site 2 this summer with the United Kingdom. This partnership with Australia and the UK is critical to our space domain awareness mission. We're also continuing to take advantage of strong space industrial base, including awarding contracts to many non-traditional space companies and implementing our recently published commercial space strategy. Simultaneously, we are aggressively tackling challenging programs to get them over the finish line. We are focused on delivering the GPS next-gen operational control segment, also known as OCX, and making significant progress towards getting the system ready to transition operations in 2025. Another one of our challenging programs, Atlas, has made significant progress. The program is on schedule to incrementally deliver space domain awareness command and control capabilities next year to enable, finally, the decommissioning of the legacy SpadeOx system. We've also proven now that we can build small satellites quickly. However, as we begin to deliver the next tranche of SDA satellites this fall, getting the military services to adopt and use these satellites will be a key success to, 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 our, to our systems. Likewise, our ability to maintain assured access to space for our space capabilities remains paramount, and launch providers must be ready to scale to meet the increased demand. We are also working to move programs out of special access program stovepipes. Thanks to DOD space classification policy update this past December, this will improve our ability to integrate space to support other domains and enable better sharing with our allies. Overall, we are doing a lot by simultaneously transforming our space architecture to make it more resilient and at the same time investing in those protect and defend missions that we need to do to guarantee the advantage we get from space and protect the joint forces. As we continue to drive speed into our acquisitions, our job and our top priority as acquisition professionals is centered around program execution. Simply defined, it means delivering programs on cost, on schedule, that work. We're taking a special interest in making sure that upfront, when we de develop our acquisition strategies and RFP documents or request for proposal documents, that they are realistic and executable, that we implement source selection strategies that leads us to awarding contracts with achievable cost and schedule baselines, and to a contractor with the right expertise, skills, and staff to do the job, and then once under contract, relentlessly managing the program baseline on a daily basis to ensure we deliver on cost and on schedule. Given the threats and increased capabilities of our competitors, it is critical that we deliver programs on cost and schedule, and this is a key focus area for me. Thank you to the subcommittee for all your support. I look forward to your questions. General Goodline. Chairman King, Ranking Member Fisher, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for your continued support and for the opportunity to testify on the Space Force's posture for fiscal year 2025. On behalf of the Secretary of the Air Force, the Honorable Frank Kendall, and the Chief of Space Operations, General B. Chance Saltzman, I am honored to share that we are wholly dedicated to forging a new service purpose-built for great power competition. Space has never been more critical to the security of our nation and to the success or failure of the joint force depends heavily upon the capabilities that we present. The repeated actions by both the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China underscore the urgency for action. Although we still maintain control of the space over our competitors, they are working hard to close the gap and assert their dominance in space. We cannot afford to let this happen. Space is the foundation for the joint force and it is fundamental to our peaceful way of life. GPS alone is an essential part of every aspect of our daily lives, from our cell phones to our banking systems and even to our ability to get crops out of the field and groceries to the shelves. We cannot let our near-peer competitors overtake us or we will lose what we hold dear. If we fail to keep pace and ultimately surrender our lead in space, every space-enabled benefit we enjoy today will be at risk and the world will become a far more dangerous place. We must maintain control of the domain in order to defend the United States and to protect the joint force from space-enabled attack. With only 3% of the DOD's budget, the Space Force offers a tremendous value proposition to the nation. Every dollar invested in space brings asymmetric returns. But that also means that every dollar cut creates asymmetric risk. Make no mistake, if we are to deter and if necessary defeat aggression in space and across the globe, we must continue to invest in the United States Space Force. Against a near-peer adversary, control of space is the linchpin. Without it, we cannot defer, deter conflict. Without it, we cannot provide vital effects. Without it, we cannot protect the joint force. And without it, we cannot win. The Space Force's theory of success includes three parts. Avoid operational surprise, 
deny first mover advantage, and conduct responsible operations in space. The Space Force budget request aligns with these priorities and is designed to support the national defense strategy by building training and equipping the forces the nation needs to preserve freedom of action in space while deterring and denying adversarial objectives. Avoiding operational surprise requires us to maintain an accurate understanding of the space domain at all times. 8.3% of our budget is dedicated to this aim. Operating across disaggregated sensor frameworks, the Space Force provides the maximum information possible to decision makers from the tactical to the strategic level. Denying first mover advantage demands that we make an unwarranted attack against the United States impractical and self-defeating. 43.4% of our budget is devoted to this objective. Investing in resiliency for missile warning and tracking satellite communications and position navigation and timing. Finally, responsible operations in space describes a mechanism by which the Space Force can test and controls the space domain. 24.7% of the FY25 Space Force budget is dedicated to this effort. Within the constraints of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, the, the FY25 Space Force budget reflects hard choices, and as a result, slows the pace of transformation and modernization. Addressing these challenges depends on guardians that are trained and ready to meet the high-tech demands of space operations. For that reason, I would like to personally thank this committee for its support of the Space Force Personnel Management Act. This will be a major force multiplier in the Space Force's efforts to modernize the way we recruit, build, and retain talent. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Space Force's FY25 budget and posture. In the face of accelerating threats, the guardians have clearly demonstrated the capability, the resolve, and the ex expertise necessary to face the challenges posed by our near-peer competitors, but there is more to do. The support of this committee enables our guardians to continue to preserve and expand our strategic advantage and outperform any pacing challenge. I would look forward to working with you as we defeat tomorrow's challenges together, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, all three. That was excellent uh, testimony, and I appreciate it. Uh, first, I want to make a, a confession. I, I noticed my colleague, Senator Kramer, is in the room. When the Space Force was first proposed, I was a skeptic. I ultimately supported it, but but I just wasn't sure that this was a direction we should need, needed to move in. I am now a convert. I think the Space Force is, is absolutely uh, in the right place at the right time, taking the right actions, and I'm, I'm glad that we have an, an organization that's dedicated strictly to that mission. So uh, maybe, I don't know how often you hear senators admit mistakes, but uh, I wanted to get that on the record. The other thing I had to notice, I had to note somewhat humorously, several years ago I visited Pine Gap in Australia with uh, members of the Intelligence Committee, which of course is a one of the major world's major ground stations for space assets and uh, we were with the intelligence committee i was sure that this was highly classified came home didn't talk about it to anyone they didn't even tell them where i went until i noticed there was a netflix series called pine gap which was set at pine gap so i guess it wasn't all that classified uh, uh, mr hill classification have how, are you making any progress on the declassification Having information that can't be used by the people that need it is not very useful information. Uh, tell, talk to me about where you are in the in the declassification process. Thank you, thank you, Chairman King. Um, yes, we're making progress. Uh, we are with the Deputy Secretary having signed out the uh, new policy, and that took us a good year to rewrite the policy. It was replacing a policy that was 20 years old. Um, a policy was clearly out of date. Uh, it provides um, an updated framework for, for uh, the program developers and operators to understand what, what's the, the minimum classification, if any classification, is necessary for a particular type of activity or program. Uh, we then turn that over to the services, and Secretary Calvelli has, has taken it very actively uh, to then um, rewrite the service class, the, the classification guides that they own for the particular uh, systems that they develop. Um, one important well, thing to understand: human nature are, is to overclassify. Yeah. Are you? Is there some systematic way to to say 
does this really need to be classified at this level? Is there a mechanism? Yeah, that, that, that policy very clearly provides that. And the direction that the, the Space Force and Secretary Calvoli have taken to heart is to move as fast as they can to update to that policy, which I expect will result in many things being removed from special access programs. That will enable better planning and integration across the joint force, as well as, and, and so if, what I could offer is maybe Secretary Calvelli could talk Please, specifically about Secretary Calvelli, your, your yeah, views. So, so there was a 2004 policy that drove most space activities into the SAP world. I mean, it was actually a written policy. Thanks to John and before him, John Plum, they actually got that policy updated for the first time in 20 years this past December. So now that frees us the ability to actually take programs out of special access channels. Because special access channels, all they do is call stovepipes. And so now we are actively have a team in place that has put together a plan and strategy. Instead of doing it program by program, we're doing it all at once. So we're doing one entire strategy up front. We'll have it in place this fall to actually remove the vast majority of all of our space programs and reclassify them into TS, top secret, and secret. They won't become unclassified, but they'll become secret and TS, which will allow a lot more sharing as well as the ability to have uh, to get rid of all those stovepipes. Thank you. I, I appreciate that and hope that project will continue. Um, a big question, not much time left. Uh, commercial integration. One of the, you t all of you talked about resiliency. One of the keys to resiliency is proliferation. Lots of smaller satellites, fewer single targets. What have we learned from Ukraine about the use of commercial satellites, particularly Starlink? Uh, has, it, has, has the theory of proliferation worked? I think we're, we're seeing that the, the innovation that came out of the commercial sector, which we're also adopting in any of the DOD architectures, that proliferation is absolutely one of the key elements of a resiliency strategy that supports mission assurance. Ukraine is, uh, is proof of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much, uh, Secretary, uh, <laughs> Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to follow up on the commercial side a little bit and how, and how that ties in. First of all, thank you to the department for issuing some um, good strategy in, in driving that forward with some goals and requirements and focus. Uh, Mr. Uh, Calvelli and General Gutlein especially, I believe you um, both need to be thanked for this. We continue to need to harness that. Uh, Mr. Secretary, one of those hard problems is achieving space domain awareness. In finding and characterizing our adversaries' activities in space, can you speak to commercial capabilities that exist today in this area, both in tra tracking algorithms and in capturing commercial imagery of objects in space, as well as any work you're doing in the private sector with this mission? Yeah, so there's a... Space domain awareness, as, as you know, is probably a key to any kind of activity we would ever have encounter in space, understanding what's in the domain and keeping track of it. And I know it's high on our list, high on General Whiting's list as well. The, uh, we are taking advantage of commercial where we can. There are some amazing companies out there that actually have ground-based telescopes today, as well as other commercial data that they're able to give and that we purchase um, through, through multiple avenues to use that. We're also updating uh, several of our radar sites, actually building new radar sites. A program called the, the Deep Advanced Space Radar, or DARK, is actually a new set of radars that we're putting in three locations, Australia in the outback, um, Texas, and then United Kingdom. And that's gonna give us space domain awareness capabilities uh, to, trace, to track really small objects in geosynchronous orbit. We're also upgrading some of our internal uh, Space Force antennas that we have or, or telescopes to do uh, space-based tracking. But a combination of upgrades that we're making on our systems as well as continuing purchasing of commercial, and as more and more commercial companies start to take on space domain awareness mission, taking advantage of that, I think over time we'll grow the capabilities that we need for space domain awareness. Do you need any, any more authorities um, or for funding to make sure that this is gonna happen? Or, or are we on the right track now, do you think? Yeah, well, I'll never say no to funding, but the, um, I think we're making plan, I think we're making progress against our plan right now. 
I mean, we could always accelerate things with additional dollars. What about authorities? For, for buying space demand awareness data? I don't see any showstoppers with authorities. I don't know if General Gutlein, you have any. Ma'am, we are, we are not challenged by authorities. We're challenged by resources. Uh, we have the Joint Commercial Office today that is a partnership with uh, industry and uh, 15 of our allied partners. We have locations in Schriever uh, here in the United States. We have locations in Australia and locations in Europe where we are buying space domain awareness data from all the providers and then sharing it openly between all members. That did not require any additional uh, authorities, but we are spending on orders of about $25 million a year to buy that data and distribute that data. That brings me to my second point about the budget request. Uh, we've seen throughout the first four years a lot of ramping up uh, for Space Force. Uh, the budget increased, and that's not the case this year. Uh, general, we're looking at flat budget growth, which really amounts to a cut with, uh, when we consider inflation into, the, into this. And it does limit Space Force's ability to meet the current uh, threats that we face. You alluded to that. Would you like to expound on that a little bit more? Yes, ma'am. I, I would put it in, in the context of two things. One, right now, there is a capability gap between us and our near-peer competitors. That capability gap is rapidly narrowing. Given the resources we have today, we had to make some very tough decisions between balancing today's readiness and investing in tomorrow. And then balancing also within the, the Fiscal Responsibilities Act that really constrained what we were able to invest in the future. If we are able to either maintain that capability gap that we currently enjoy today or to widen that capability gap, we're going to have to expand the amount of resources that we're spending in space. Do you, how, how can we make that point clear? Um, you know, Senator King and I speak often about uh, looking at classification of information that's out there so that, first of all, um, many of our colleagues, uh, I, I think, would uh, pay more attention to, to that if their constituents or the media is paying attention to what would be declassified and the information put out. Um, so how do we get, get it to the public? Ma'am, we have got to talk about it. If you look at uh, the Space Force that stood up in 2019, prior to 2019, we didn't talk about this. It was too highly classified. We didn't share data with our, with our allies, et cetera. Since 2019, we have changed that dialogue. We have a long way to catch up, though, in this information environment of educating the, both the public as well as our members on the Hill of what the challenges in space are. But more importantly, the dependencies that we have as a nation, as a free society on space, outside of the military, on a day-to-day -day basis, are immense. And we've got to get that message across. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've often thought of the Fiscal Responsibility Act as a straitjacket we put on ourselves. Uh, and now we're, we're dealing with the consequences, not only in your budget, but across the board. Um, Senator Kramer, the godfather of the Space Force. <laughs> Th thanks. And your confession was very heartwarming. Um, <laughs> I bet it was really good for your soul. Um, anyway, that's... Uh, um, thank you, gentlemen, for being, and that, Frank, and thank you for your candor, too. I think this is really important. Um, the, um, I want to start with the disruptor side of things. Uh, Secretary Covell, you referenced non-traditional, <clears throat> you know, partners. Um, it, space is so interesting because the Air Force has these wonderful prime contractors that respond to whatever they're asked of. Space seems to me to be responding to the, private sector itself, the commercial side, which, you know, has been so active, um, and that's good. I remember one of my very first discussions with General Raymond was, you have a white sheet of paper, please don't, please utilize the, the, the freedom that that provides and, and don't adapt to the culture that you're coming from. Um, so whether it's a, a, a disruptor in the private sector, with the, the, you talk a lot about fixed price as a, as a contributor to competition. Um, when I think of the SDA, the Space Development Agency, I always, I always think of the SDA as the disruptor within the service itself. And I'm sure that creates a lot of tensions, and, and I can recount several conversations in the last few years, particularly the early couple of years. Um, so with the spiral development concept that you all use with, and the SDA uses, help me understand the role of SDA as the acquisition, you know, sort of, part of the shop, 
and then their role in, in providing, any, whether it's maintenance or management, um, participating, or are they just sort of the, you just go to them and say, buy, we need 100 more of these things, buy them. Um, and, and I say that, I ask that question honestly, with some concern that SDA could end up getting a little bit handcuffed and not be the disruptor we need them to be within the larger space force. Does, if that makes sense, and you could elaborate and correct me where I'm wrong. No, I think you're right. The, uh, <laughs> Thank you. The, so, so SDA has been doing a magnificent job in terms of getting capabilities to orbit. So their first <laughs> spiral of what they call Tron Zero got 27 satellites on orbit, eight, eight missile warning missile tracking satellites, and, and uh, 19 uh, transport satellites. And we're demonstrating those capabilities now. Tranche One will start launching Again, uh, this December will be the first set of launches for there. Again, more transport satellites, and then next spring, more tracking satellites. So from where they fit in, all things proliferated at low Earth orbit that relate to missile warning, missile tracking, as well as data transport, SDA is our go-to. That is their strength. Their strength is small sats, proliferation, low Earth orbit, hundreds of miles above the Earth. We tend to go to like Space Systems Command for the more traditional missions, such as military satellite communications at higher altitudes, higher altitudes for missile warning for launch, for space domain awareness. And then we tend to go to Space RCO for things that are related to, I'll say, protect and defend kind of missions mm -hmm. that are unique that, uh, that, go, that would go directly to support Space Command. But uh, overall, it's working out pretty good. Um, SDA is part of the Space Force. They're part of the family. They fit in. Even though they're a little bit disruptive, they fit in pretty nicely, actually. I think they are showing the way to the other parts of the organization that by building smaller and by using fixed price, you actually can go faster. I'm really impressed with the, them bringing in new space companies like Sierra Space and Rocket Lab and York Systems and using commercial bus lines like we see like at Airbus and at, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and at Turan Orbital. And I think those are all really healthy things for the country. So, you know, under my watch, I expect to continue to see SDA can keep doing their great work. And I think the biggest thing we'll see down the road is we need to make sure as we launch Tranche 1, which is operational systems next year, yes. that people use it. Yeah. Right? It doesn't matter how fast we build them if no one uses them. And yeah. we need to get the services to, to ramp on and adopt it. General, just elaborating a little bit on that, in, in, then in, is there a handoff or does SDA continue to sort of operate in that space um, after the assets are, are, are launched? And, and uh, as, as the Secretary said, if no one uses them, but if no one's using them, does SDA continue sort of using them and, and helping develop, develop new and spiral at, as, uh, as they're operating what they've done already? Yes, Senator. So as Secretary Calvelli said, we have integrated the uh, Space Development Agency fully into the United States. I space understand Force. that. So they are a part of the team. Their capabilities are being detail planned into our war games, our exercises mm. uh, going forward and into our uh, war plans. So we are already counting on that capability and starting to test it. As like, he, like Secretary Calvelli said, we've already proved Link 16 from space. We are now taking that capability and playing it into the exercises to see how it plays, understanding how it's going to uh, support in a contested environment, and how do we continue to take advantage of it. Thank you. And I'll may, I, if there's another round, I may get into some of the budget stuff. Thank you, Mr. Senator Tuberville. We, use, we, we recently had a, a discussion with General Salzman about refueling, uh, and he wanted $20 million, I think, in the 2025 budget. Uh, how far are we behind China in refueling? Uh, this, this $20 million was only for a study. Uh, can, can you explain that? I mean, $20 million for a study other than $20 million more for learning how to refuel and why we need to refuel and, and how far behind we are. Uh, anybody want to answer? Yes, Senator, that's a good question, and, and I do recall you asking uh, the CSO about that question. Um, right now, we are doing the exploration of refueling in space to understand what does it actually contribute to the fight, because there is a balance between building refueling capability into a satellite, which is semi-expensive, and buying proliferated lower-cost constellations. So we're going to need a combination of both. We're not sure what orbits are going to be which. We're not sure how we're going to do refueling as a service yet. So the $20 million is to actually study those effects. Anybody else want to? 
And, then, and some of that fun actually goes to some demonstrations as well. We're not, not on space, but on the ground side, actually looking at what it takes to go build uh, the refueling unit and some demonstrations that we're doing on the ground side in terms of just the, the concept of well as the two space vehicles docking and being able to actually put a refueling module in and how the refueling works. So some of that money is, is going to study work to see where the bigger picture is. Um, and other, other, some of that money is also going to actually design work and demonstration work. Going back to commercial capabilities, uh, are we leveraging those the right way, General? Yes, Senator, we are. Uh, uh, Secretary uh, Hill just talked about publishing of the DOD's commercial space strategy. On the heels of that, we published the Space Force commercial space strategy, which is all about how do I take advantage of space to start filling in resiliency, capacity, and redundancy into our capabilities. What we do know today is I cannot build all the kit that I'm going to need. We're going to have to rely on partnerships, partnerships with allies, and partnerships with our uh, industrial partners. If you go back to the history of the United States, we've always relied on our industrial base uh, during times of crisis or conflict, and this is going to be no different. So we are currently designing in how to take maximum advantage of those capabilities and innovation that's coming out of commercial to build out what we call hybrid architectures, which are a combination of DOD, civil, allied, and commercial platforms all together to get us to that capacity and that resiliency that we need in the future. There's not a week goes by that I don't have somebody coming from Huntsville that's building new uh, satellites. Uh, I mean, it seems like it's a growing trend, and whether it's building or refueling or using nuclear energy to, to in, in satellites or offensive or defensive satellites, uh, do y'all see the same thing? I mean, are, are y'all overwhelmed with with people that are getting in the satellite business sector? It's, a, it's amazing. I mean, we're very fortunate, knock on wood, and I hope it keeps us right, that the space economy is starting to boom, and we're seeing amazing entrepreneurship from across the United States, and companies come in. I, it's, a week doesn't go by that a new company doesn't come in and tell me about some great concept that they're pursuing and doing. And what's really wonderful is that they're also getting great investment dollars as well to be able to start themselves off. So we're excited about the new space economy that's booming. Seems like they got a lot of money they want to invest, which is fine with us, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it helps us all. Uh, General, what about uh, retention, recruiting and retention in the Space Force? Could you talk a little bit about that? Thank you, Senator. We have the highest recruiting and retention in the United States Space Force today. We have continuously exceeded our recruiting goals uh, by several hundred. We have more people beating on our door to come into the Space Force than we can possibly take uh, efficiently today. So that's a great problem. From the retention side of the equation, we're also doing great. We're in the high 90s on both enlisted and on c civilians, and we're able to retain that technical talent that we need for a complicated uh, domain. Seems like that would be your, one of your most important things, the retention experience. Uh, a lot of money out there in the private sector. We just talked about building satellites. So you don't see any problem in retention? We haven't had that problem? No, sir, we have not had that retention tonight. Today in the United States Space Force, uh, we are constantly watching for it. We are constantly trying to make sure that we're giving our guardians an experience and that we're giving them the tools that they need to be successful. But like I said, right now, we're in the high 90s for both our enlisted and our officers for retention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, let me just say thanks to all of you for your service to our country. And we appreciate the opportunity to have this open briefing. Um, I, I, I want to focus on just a couple items that I think um, we sometimes miss in the discussion when we're in a classified session, and, and, and part of it is is the budget itself. Uh, on May 1st of this year, in front of the, uh, the SASC hearing on the Space Force posture, um, it was reported that, that we've got basically a decrease in the Space Force budget for 25 from 24. Um, the request in the FY25 is $29.4 billion, which is a decrease of $600 million from FY24. Uh, $18.7 billion for research, development, and testing. Um, the FY24 request was $19.2 billion. The enacted was $18.6. That's almost $600 million less. Uh, we're talking an additional $600 million, $650 million less with regard to procurement. And we're talking $122 million less with regard to operations and maintenance. And we're looking at uh, about $9 million less, almost $10 million less, with regard to military personnel. 
Look, it, it, that does not bode well for the fact that out of the five domains we've got, air, land, sea, space, and cyberspace, to walk in and suggest that while China and Russia are both expanding their operations in space, it would appear from the budget numbers themselves that we're suggesting a decrease in our operational capacity. Mr. Hill, your thoughts? Senator Rounds, uh, that hits the nail on the head of a problem we face this year. We've all mentioned it. Uh, I mentioned it. Uh, I think chairman or the ranking member mentioned the, uh, the constraints of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, one, that was one of the factors we had to deal with this year. Two is something that uh, General Gutlein spoke to, the, the, the different nature of the Space Force budget. So when you get through putting together all the must-pay bills, and the Department of Defense has must-pay bills of salary and support to families and, and uh, operations and so forth of the forces, um, and you get down to what's left of discretionary, you come down to, and areas like readiness, research development, test and evaluation. We're cutting it, aren't we? And procurement. And so where are you going to make those cuts? The cuts focused more, maintain the readiness, sacrifice some of the future. And that, those investment accounts are very, uh, the Space Force has a high concentration. Let me, of, let me go on. General Goodline, I, I, I think you, you wear the uniform. And it's always your professional opinion that we're looking for. And that is, is how much do you need in order to do your job? And right now I'm looking at this saying we're reducing what you have and expecting you to get the job done. The bottom line is, is we're expecting more out of Space Force in the next couple of years than we've ever expected in the past as we remove some of our air-based capabilities, ISR specifically. What is the number that is appropriate as opposed to what we're seeing in the proposed budget? Senator, I can't give you a number. I can tell you that the threat is increasing daily. They are intent on not only denying our ability to use space, they are actually proving extremely capable at denying our ability to use space. And they are trying to narrow that gap of capability down to zero or even negative. And we've got to increase that gap. General, if, if, if we were in a classified session and we asked you which programs, which products, which plans you proposed were denied in this budget, would you be able to give us a straight answer at that time? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, look, look, let me go on just a little bit. Right now, we've got guys in the Gulf sitting on destroyers and other, other, other uh, uh, equipment that we've got that are in harm's way. Part of what we expect is to be able to provide them with accurate information, intel, ISR, uh, to be able to identify the guys that are shooting at them, the hooties. Today, uh, in the Gulf, we have reduced numbers of those types of assets available, and yet we've got guys still sitting there. Now, they're knocking off the actual, the actual weapons that are being shot at them, but I think it's about time that we start using the assets that we've got to find the guys that are making the decisions on when to shoot them and take them out before they're attacking our people. The ISR that we've got right now is air-based and space-based. Are we in a position to provide the type of ISR necessary today in space to actually provide these folks with real-time information about who the bad guys are and where they're at and how we get at them? Yes, Senator, we can provide that, that information from space and we do it every single day. Thank but you. as this threat continues to mature, we're gonna need additional ISR capabilities both in air as well as in space. Thank you. I think that's a very straightforward answer. We need both, don't we? Correct. In, 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 in air-based and space-based. Yes, sir. And right now we're short on both. And the closer in though we get to the actual threat itself, we need to start going more towards space to become resilient and to get around the anti-access area denial capabilities of our adversaries. But the standoff capability very much needs to be airborne and into other types of conflict also needs to be airborne. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Warren. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. When Russia invaded Ukraine, it destroyed Ukraine's internet and its telephone access. And to help get Ukraine back online, SpaceX, one of our defense contractors, donated satellite internet terminals called Starlink. And this allowed Ukrainian soldiers to run apps to target Russian forces 
and to be able to communicate with loved ones back home. Earlier this month, I wrote to DOD about Russia's use of Starlink terminals. Uh, reports indicate that Russia has been able to buy Starlink terminals on the black market and that SpaceX has not cut off their access, and that provides a major advantage to Russia on the battlefield. Now, SpaceX is owned by Elon Musk, who has advocated for, quote, a peace plan, close quote, that reports suggest may have been developed after speaking with Vladimir Putin. Congress has a constitutional responsibility to make sure that taxpayer money does not go to companies that undermine U.S. national security goals. So I think it's critical that we get to the bottom of this. Mr. Hill, you oversee our space and missile defense, and you've been working with SpaceX to counter illicit use of Starlink terminals. Let me start by asking, was SpaceX completely cooperative with DOD in its efforts to address the use of Starlink terminals by Russian forces? Senator, not only has SpaceX been very cooperative with the entire United States government and the government of Ukraine, they've been forward-leaning and identifying and bringing okay. information to us. Good, good. I'm glad to hear it because it's obviously critical that DOD contractors aren't undermining U.S. foreign policy. So. Russia's outdated communications have been a major contributor to their failures in Ukraine. Starlink obviously would be enormously valuable to the Russians. Uh, it would provide Russia with secure communications that they sorely need, which would significantly erode Ukraine's advantage on the battlefield. And I understand this is classified, uh, an unclassified environment, so I don't want to go anywhere where we shouldn't. But I think there's a compelling public interest to conduct this oversight and to understand how DOD is plugging leaks here. So, Mr. Hill, in the broadest terms, can you describe how you worked with SpaceX to address it to this illicit use? So in broadest terms, um, recognizing that um, Russia has longstanding experience operating black markets and yes. is now leveraging black markets of their own. Um, uh, we have one point, the commercial integration cell. This is a cell uh, that combines space operations center where commercial companies and the U.S. government can work together and can share information, including company proprietary information and classified information. That's one point where we can learn what's going on. They can share with us what they're seeing. We can share what they're seeing. Um, broader across the government, uh, we, can, I, we can then develop strategies. Is it better to identify all the terminals that should be left on, or should we identify terminals that should be turned off? Different types of approach to list. We've done that with them. Okay, so let me ask this maybe... Uh, a uh, little more pointedly, do you have confidence that moving forward, DOD can identify illicit Russian use of Starlink services and completely shut them off? I think this will be a continuous problem. Uh, I take that as a no. I, I think we, we can continue to identify them and turn them off, but I think Russia will not stop it. Okay, so you think it's going to be an ongoing process. You know, yeah. it, war obviously is an unpredictable uh, uh, unfolding, but we shouldn't have to worry about whether or not U.S. contractors are supporting our adversaries or giving access to our adversaries. And... My understanding is that Space Force is negotiating an extension of its Starlink contract with SpaceX. So, Mr. Hill, can you assure me that as you renegotiate this contract, that you will have provisions in place that will require SpaceX to do everything within its ability to prevent illicit use by Russia and other forces? Our contracts, in conjunction with the licenses that regulatory agencies provide, and that's DOD doesn't control those, together 
they ensure that they ensure what you're looking for. And SpaceX complies with our contracts, and they comply with the licenses they have from regulatory agencies who can enforce those licenses and the various civil and criminal. Well, I, okay, I'm, I'm not quite. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. And I get it. We are in an unclassified setting here. The devil is always in the details. Uh, I taught contract law for many years, uh, so I would ask you to submit to the committee the conditions that give you confidence that SpaceX is bound contractually so that it will prevent illicit use of those terminals by Russia. You know, I just think it's critically important that DOD hold its contractors accountable for any mismanagement or any illegal acquisition of its hardware and services by bad actors. Uh, and we just want to make sure that Russia's not getting an advantage here. And in responding to the letter that you mentioned at yeah. the outset, we will be addressing those kinds of things okay. for you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Kramer was next. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for all being here for the work that you do. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to just go right into it and talk about uh, Iran, Russia. We're going to stay on this topic uh, a little bit about Russia, but now Iran, Russia, and their space collaboration, because. They're both driven by a shared interest in countering U.S. superiority in space. Iran and Russia, they are deepening their cooperation in space. And we know just this past February, Russia launched an Iranian satellite into orbit, and the two countries have signed an agreement for their space industries to cooperate. Iran's 10-year space program relies on Russian assistance for its operations, from launching their high payload satellites to the ultimate goal of sending an Iranian into space. So, Mr. Hill, what are the security, and I'm not sure if you can speak to the threat implications, but uh, uh, maybe the general can, knowing that we're in an open session, of the joint Iranian-Russian space cooperation, and how is the U.S. addressing and navigating this emerging state partnership uh, that uh, I think we might be worried about? And I would add it doesn't stop at Iran. It also involves North Korea. Uh, as, as we've seen with uh, Iran and North Korea providing Russia uh, missiles mm -hmm. to uh, support Russia's operations in Ukraine, and then Russia likely providing them technology assistance uh, in, the, in their programs to uh, expand the threats that they present to us and to others. Um, the uh, responses of uh, controlling transfers of technology have, have their limitations. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, ability to, we certainly are, are watching what they're doing, but the ability to cu continue cutting off Russian and Iran and uh, North Korea is fundamentally at the crux of it, but they're going to keep pressing on those. And maybe, you and know, I, We probably need a closed that, session to talk about how, yeah, uh, what this yeah. uh, really entails. And so um, if you can speak to it at all, otherwise we will wait for the closed session. Senator, I cannot go into the, into the specific details. I can tell you it's troubling. Uh, we are seeing proliferation of technology. Uh, we are seeing uh, support of launch technology, which can quickly lead to something larger like an intercontinental ballistic missile. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia is a nuclear-armed uh, uh, nation. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely don't want that technology to proliferate. And then it also opens up additional fronts of concern uh, in, during conflict. Thank you. I appreciate that. We'll look forward to the closed session. Um, and I'm going to build on this because... Um, we have international partners, just like they have international partnerships. We have our own international partnerships, and so we work with our partners and allies. It's crucial to providing this layered, um, comprehensive approach that we're going to need to combat this. And so the success of international cooperation was actually seen in the recent uh, unsuccessful attack on Israel carried out by Iran and the successful shootdown of over 300 uh, inbound threats. And that Defensive action relied on sharing space capabilities with our partners in the region. So, General, can you discuss the importance of these international partnerships um, as much as you can in, in response to what we just asked and, and really about what happened just recently? We thwarted that attack, helped to thwart that on Israel by Iran. Yes, ma'am. I, I would say our partnerships, both with industry and with our allies, is one of our competitive advantages uh, that we continue to uh, nurture and to. Uh, uh, expand. Um, 
it is hard to be everywhere at all times. As you saw in the Middle East, there, there were threats coming from multiple different directions. And luckily, we have spent many years working with our allies to integrate our capabilities mm -hmm. so that what we see, they see, uh, and that we can actually do handoffs of threats from one nation to another. And that actually paid a lot of dividends. So going forward, I would expect to see greater partnerships with our allies, not less. A lot of our strengths is in our partnerships and our allies and friends around the world and that continued training and investing in that. And speaking of investing in what you need to do all this, it relies on technology. So we have to have the technology workforce. And we have a huge shortage. There is a, not just in this area, in every area of technology. It's a vital part of ensuring that every bit of our armed services is capable and prepared for the threats that are coming towards us, especially space. And so I'm going to keep going back to you, General, as newest branch of the armed services. Um, do you currently possess and have access to the skilled workforce you need to complete your mission? And what are the challenges um, that you're facing uh, recruiting? What do we need to do to help you invest in, in that kind of um, workforce that you're going to need to enter in to uh, keep us safe in space? Thank you, Senator. Space, as I, as I uh, stated a little bit earlier, our retention and our recruiting are extremely high. We are exceeding our recruiting numbers every year by several hundred. But what's more important is the quality and the experience level of those recruits is off the charts. Uh, most of them are a little older than their, than their normal peers that are coming in recruiting. 53% of them have at least a bachelor's degree or a uh, 14 hours plus towards it. 14% of our recruits actually have a bachelor's degree or higher when we recruit them. It is in a very technical workforce. So today we are meeting those numbers. Uh, the, the, the challenge going forward is going to, how do I grow efficiently? I can't just accept everybody that wants to come in today and, and get them trained. Uh, so we are trying to balance our, our training resources with how many people we can recruit going forward and what is, what is an efficient way to grow forward in the, in the future. Thank you. Appreciate that. I yield back. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think... Uh, I'm going to start with the secretary here. Um, so China and Russia has uh, continuously and uh, developing anti-satellite systems, um, and that really concerns, I think, all of us. And I want to talk specifically about one capability we have on orbit, and that's the space-based infrared system that we use. It's on orbit today that we use to detect launches from the surface, um, often um, strategic ballistic missiles that could be heading in our direction. And they could be vulnerable. And I want to understand from you, Mr. Secretary, um, have we be, been thinking about the degradation and maybe denial of use of that system and what that would mean overall to our missile warning capability? Yes, yes we have. In fact, uh, we are re-architecting that system and building a proliferated layer at medium Earth orbit and a proliferated layer in low Earth orbit. In fact, there's eight satellites that we launched already for the LEO option just against that threat. And so we'll maintain the, through orbit diversity and through proliferation, so we'll maintain the geo orbit for the, sh for the near term. We'll have the MEO orbit coming of age starting in 26 and we'll have the LEO orbit starting to get populated now. So because you are totally correct, because of the threat against capabilities like missile warning that the nation relies on and needs, we are fundamentally changing the architecture to build a proliferated layer, layer at LEO and MEO that's highly, much more highly resilient than the few big juicy targets today at GEO. And you know, beyond that, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, system that looks over the horizon, you know, with radar. But beyond that, there's, other than the, um, you know, orbit capability, the infrared capability we have in space, there's probably not many other ways to detect a first launch of a, of a ballistic missile. Is that correct? I'm not as familiar with uh, what our terrestrial-based systems. I, I know from space that we, we rely really heavily on the old DSPs as well as what's known as SIBRs, like you mentioned, for yeah. missile warning from space. Yeah, I'm really concerned about this because if, if we were to lose the you know, space-based infrared you know, system, um, it makes us very vulnerable to a first strike without being able to detect it. You're right. It, but, it, but, I mean, on the good side, sir, we are 
The Space Force has been very proactive in this area. Mm -hmm. We are funded and we are building and we're already starting to launch more proliferated systems to do missile warning and add capability to also help track. And to the extent that we can talk about it in this setting, uh, can, you, can you give us an idea of when this MEO and LEO system will be complete? Yeah, the, uh, so there's eight demo satellites on orbit in LEO today that are being tested. There's, uh, there's a, another 32 that'll go up over the 25, 26 timeframe in LEO. That'll be what we call a tranche one. And on the MEO side, right now we have planned nine satellites in the 26, 27 timeframe. And what level of redundancy does that provide us? So what I'm getting at is how many of those could we lose in LEO and MEO and still retain the full capability to detect a launch from Russia or China? The system is really interesting. It's, it's the, I think our Space Warfighting Analysis Center did a great job designing it. And what it is is that they're basically independent layers. So you could take out all of one and still do the mission with the other, as an example. You could take out the LEO constellation you could get everything from MEO or vice versa. Yeah. Could you take out half of the MEO satellites as well and get the coverage you need? You know, the, the beauty of proliferation is, uh, you, you know, you, you get the coverage through having more assets. I think the more you take out, you know, the, the more capability you lose, right? And mm -hmm. so, but, uh, but building smaller systems, you can replenish much quicker as well. So, but, but obviously, sir, like you're right, the more you take out, the more it hurts. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we'll have a second round for those who are interested. Uh, Mr. Hill, just to clarify in your exchanges with Senator Warren, is there any evidence that Starlink or SpaceX is willingly or knowingly allowing the Russians to utilize those black market terminals that they've acquired? To the contrary, there is every evidence that when SpaceX becomes aware of things, they try to work with the U.S. government to come up with the best solution for how to turn them off to confirm that those terminals should be turned off and that they're not getting like a false positive. Okay. Yeah, so there's no, there's no evidence that SpaceX is, as I say, willingly trying to utilize correct. themselves. Correct. Yeah, you're correct. Thank you. Um, General, um, you've talked several times about the, working with allies. It strikes me that that's one of our re really asymmetric advantages. Are we working with allies also, and I suppose this could go to either of you, in terms of the development of, this, of these technologies? In other words, all wisdom on technology doesn't necessarily reside here, and we've got allies like Japan, the EU, Scandinavia that could be very, we could get more, uh, more out of our dollars if we, are working jointly with uh, with these close allies. Yes, Senator, we are. We are building uh, uh, collaborative projects. Uh, for example, uh, SATCOM with Luxembourg, SATCOM with Norway, uh, PNT with uh, Japan. Uh, so we are broadening out those partnerships on a daily basis, building ground-based radars in Australia uh, as well as in the UK, uh, collaborating on launch with New Zealand. So we are across the board trying to embrace our allies. And I will give uh, uh, kudos to our folks in policy that were able to break down the classification barriers that once we put those into place will also allow us to have broader conversations with our allies. Well, it, it, in my discussions with some of our allies, ITAR keeps coming up as a possible barrier. Is that, how, do we, how are we dealing with that? So I'd pass that to Secretary Calvelli. <laughs> Passing to John Hill, that's a State Department issue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Is, is this uh, ITAR is always a concern um, uh, that al allies will have if they are worried about having to incorporate U.S. technologies into systems they are developing. They worry that somehow our licensing system will prevent them doing what they want to do. I think with respect to the question, though, of just general collaboration, between the Defense Department and allies um, as they grow their defense budgets to meet, for example, NATO targets. ITAR isn't really a factor in, in that situation. We can develop the collaborative program and, and then work with the allies. All of what we've been talking about today in terms of defense has largely been about resiliency, pr uh, proliferation, many systems. Uh, the cornerstone of our defense strategy for 70 years, has, however, has been deterrence. That is, the adversary fears the consequences of, 
an, uh, an aggressive action against this country. Is deterrence part of our strategy in space, Mr. Secretary? I think absolutely yes, but I think one of the challenges is is, is the classification levels, and so you. Well, can't it's not deter deterrence if the adversary doesn't, doesn't know, know about, about it. it. You are correct, and I'll I'll defer to uh, to General Gulai and the Space Force on deterrence. That's Doctor Strangelove 101. General Senator, integrated deterrence is a foundation uh, of our strategy. Uh, we do balance on a day-to-day -day basis what capabilities we decide to reveal and conceal. Uh, to make sure that the adversary knows that uh, we are intent on maintaining that capability gap and protecting and defending our capabilities uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so in, in deterrence is the cornerstone of every, everything that we're trying to do. And if you think back to General Saltzman's, uh, one of his core themes is uh, uh, competitive endurance. Under competitive endurance, we'd rather be in a state of constant competition and to deter aggression rather than be into a state of conflict. Thank you. Um, I have to... Go to another hearing. Uh, Vice Chair Fisher is going to preside, and uh, it's over to her for a second round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, again, to follow up with uh, uh, what the Chairman was talking about and tying it into the budget, um, I know there's a robust unfunded priorities list, both from General Whiting and from General Salzman. And in this setting, can you discuss some of the general capabilities that Space Force could move ahead with if you were provided with those additional resources? Um, when we talk about deterrence, that's, that's the point of this. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator. Uh, General Salzman earlier last month submitted our unfunded priority list uh, to the tune of about $1.15 billion. Uh, in that list was resiliency for our ground systems, uh, power upgrades, uh, HVAC systems, what, what have you, because the Space Force fights from in place. So our facilities, our power and cooling is really our JP-8, our fuel, if you will. That is our weapon system. So he's asking for money to invest in resiliency. He asked for money in the working capital fund uh, to get it, to, to remove it from DISA over to the Space Force so that we have a business model to actually procure additional commercial capacity for our warfighters and for our nation. He asked for $19 million for the National Space and Test and Training Center, which is building out our ability to do advanced tests and advanced training in a live virtual constructive environment. Uh, he asked for $60 million to restore the, the small launch uh, program so that we can provide ride shares to our uh, industry partners and to our academic partners. Uh, he asked for $786 million uh, in classified space control capabilities to ensure that we can protect and defend our, ability, our capabilities on space. And he asked for $43 million to allow the Space Development Agency to do experimentation. Thank you, sir, very much. Hopefully we can uh, start to deliver on some of those. Uh, Senator Kramer, do you have additional questions? I don't because I was going to get into Huh. Thank you. Senator Rounds, any other questions? Thank you, Madam Chair, or Vice Chair. Uh, for Mr. Hill and uh, General Gutlin, are you aware of the 20-month uh, Embers study that authorized, it was authorized to explore the sharing of the electromagnetic spectrum in the critical 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz band? I am. And it, and it, are you aware that this was a study that included the whole of government as well as representatives of defense contractors and the telecommunications industry? Yes, Senator. Yes, Senator. Are you aware of the finding of this interagency study group that sharing in this band between federal and commercial systems is not feasible unless, and I quote, certain regulatory, technological, and resourcing conditions are met and implemented? Yes, Senator. Yes, Senator. Are you also aware that the estimate of this interagency study was that implementing the conditions could take 30 years and $260 billion in this portion of the electromagnetic band alone, even if the very stringent conditions were able to be met? Yes, Senator. Yes, Senator. Are you also aware of the legislative proposals in the Commerce Committee calling for the use of the 7 to 8 gigahertz band of the spectrum where the Space Force and other services maintain similarly critical systems for the defense of our country? 
Yes, Senator. Yes, Senator. Can you tell the subcommittee where you stand on these efforts if they proceed forward without the most stringent conditions, such as the development and implementation of the dynamic spectrum sharing, the interference safeguards, and a massive influx of federal resources to maintain the defense of this country? Senator, spectrum is vital to our uh, way of life. It is actually a natural resource, just like water or air. And just like water or air, we need to protect that vital resource. Uh, we need to make sure it's not contested. We make sure it's not polluted. And we need to make sure it's not controlled. If you look at the seven to eight gigahertz spectrum band that you're talking about, that is where most of our uh, uh, NC3, so our nuclear command and control capabilities uh, lie. Uh, those systems have been purposely de designed for that spectrum. And if we were pushed outside of that spectrum, those systems that took us decades to develop and billions of dollars to develop would have to be reconstituted in some sort or fashion. If you look at just the wideband gap filler system, we have 10 of those on orbit today, they cost about $600 million a, per, a piece. Each one of those takes four years to develop. Just looking at just that one piece of the architecture for wideband gap filler, that's $6 billion and at least a decade to reconstitute. To, 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 to assume that we could even find another spectrum that it could operate. You amplify that across all of our capabilities and you start to see the large numbers that you just uh, talked about in that study. So it would be detrimental to us to lose that spectrum. Mr. Hill, anything to add to that? That was excellent summary of how we use it. The National Security Community, Defense Department, Intelligence Community, when we have been allocated spectrum, we have invested heavily to utilize that spectrum. The nation has tremendous investments that are put at risk when we, if we carelessly start reallocating spectrum. The national security community needs to be at the table whenever this conversation comes up. Would you suspect that our adversaries would love to see us uh, try to disrupt our ability to use those specific bands? Absolutely. Our adversaries always like to see us disrupt ourselves. We have met the enemy, and sometimes the enemy is us. One other thought, I, I note also that in the 3.1 to 3.4 gigahertz area, the uh, LRDR, or the Long Range Discriminating Radar, actually sits in that band as well, doesn't it? It does, and that is our last line of defense to protect the homeland from a nuclear launch from uh, North Korea. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Rounds, for opening up that line of discussion. I would just follow that up as a member of the Commerce Committee that there um, are some bills out there that look at spectrum auctions. Uh, there are deep concerns by many members, obviously, on Armed Services Committee, but uh, on Commerce Committee as well. And do you believe it would be wise, in fact, it would be vital for senators before um, moving on any kind of legislation to have auction in the bans that were discussed previously by Senator Rounds, that they would at least contact DOD for technical advice? Yes, Senator. Yes, the Defense Department needs to be part of the conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. As you said, this is... Um, uh, national security issue, and it would be detrimental for us to lose access for, of that spectrum for our security. Is that, am I restating that correctly? Yes, Senator. It would be detrimental for us to lose access to that natural resource. Correctly and more, more succinctly than I usually do. Thank you. You did a nice job, Mr. Hill. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anything else from senators that are present? Thank you very much, and with that, I thank our uh, panel for being here. Look forward to continuing our discussions, and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.